Welcome to Bring the World Home, a production of the Returned Peace Corps Volunteers of Hawaii. My name is Doug Long, and I'll be your host for today's program. I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Swaziland, Southern Africa, from 1992 to 1993. Peace Corps has three objectives. The first is to provide needed services in countries served. The second is to share America and Ameri American culture in those countries. And the third is for us as volunteers to share our experiences with America. Hopefully a message of love, friendship, and community is exhibited in each of our programs. With us today is Zavi Breeze Sanders. She served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Albania, 1996 and 1997. Welcome to the show, Zavi. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me today. I think uh, you are our first guest that uh, served in Eastern Europe or Southeast Europe. Southeast yeah. Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have a new story for us that we haven't heard before? This is going to be very interesting. Oh, good. Very good. Uh, well, let's find out where Albania wa is, first of all. Um, the Hawaiian Islands are here, mm -hmm. and uh, Albania is still in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, all it may be hard to see. Here. All right. Right above Greece. And so what, are, what are the other bordering countries? Um, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia in Kosovo and Montenegro, which are also part of Yugoslavia. Okay. We as Americans are really bad at geography, it seems, so we have to be uh, educated as we go here. So, I did too. When I first find out, found out I was going there, I had to do a bit of research to find out exactly where I was going as well. Mm -hmm. So most of the volunteers we've talked to on the program all went to uh, you know, tropical or warm climates, and uh, that was definitely not the case with you. No, um, and I actually ended up going to one of the colder sites with Peace Corps in Albania. So I was up on a mountain um, where we had snow for about three months out of the year, and it was frozen longer than that. Um, um, the climate in Albania is, um, changes quite a bit from being very coastal Mediterranean, hot, dry summers, um, cool winters, but not really cold, um, up to Alps, where it's really cold in the winter, snowed in and inaccessible for many months out of the year. Um, and my site was in sort of an intermediate zone where it was much colder um, than the coastal areas, but it wasn't snowed in for a majority of the, or for the larger part of the winter. We could still get in and out um, through the mountain passes and, and, and access the city and supplies and everything else that we needed. Did you live in a city? Um, I did not. Um, I lived, I was uh, in the agroforestry program, so we were working with farmers um, trying to help them start income generating businesses related to forestry um, in the rural areas. So I was in a village, a bigger village um, for Albania of about um, 3,000 people in the village. Um, sort of, um, again, it was up in the mountains, so the village itself was rather steep, sort of went up the side of a hill. Mm. Um, and had beautiful views to overlooking a large lake that divides Albania from Macedonia. So it was very, very, very close to the Macedonian border. It took about an hour and a half to walk to the actual border if I wanted to go there. Okay. So uh, were you in a house or an apartment? Or? Um, actually, in Albania, we did host families. You unless did. you were living, unless you were living in a major city or you were part of a married couple, um, you were in a host family um, for a few reasons. Um, Security probably being the biggest one. Um, Albania has a very strong code of ethics as far as guests. And so if you're going into an area, and we were the first um, group to go into the area where I was living, I was the first volunteer to live in that area. Um, and going in as an outsider, it was very important that we were part of a family because then as part of that family, um, we were respected as part of the village and not so much seen as an outsider. Mm -hmm. um, so it acted, it acted as very much a sort of a security system um, for us okay. in, the, in the villages, especially for women, because it's very much a patriarchal society there where women don't go alone, don't go out alone, and don't, you know, don't go visiting without um, escorts yeah. or within a larger group of women. So even this, uh, though this is a you know European country. Um, is the, the social, uh, social culture and interactions you know, uh, different from uh, what we know as in our American culture? Very much, very much. Um, and I actually 
got to see that quite a bit because I was working with farmers who were all men. Um, and I actually had to go, um, I started a project that was in a bit of a remote area because there was land there that we could use to start a nursery. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was, we had to hike up a mountain and go back in this valley and it was just goat trails and I could not go there alone. So I would have payroll sometimes and I would have to find someone, another American, to go with me. Otherwise, I was putting myself at risk um, for reputation probably more than anything else. Um, but it was not seen as a good thing. And one time I did go up there alone and got scolded very strongly from the workers up there saying, you really shouldn't you know, be wandering off in the hills and coming up here without someone else. Is that because you were a Peace Corps volunteer or an American? And it's you because were I was just perceived women, female. Female. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was crime a problem or? Um, um, it, it was in the larger areas and it was, again, if you were walking alone, as a woman walking alone, you were putting yourself, uh, you were sort of labeling yourself as more of a risk taker and putting yourself at risk that way. So, so things potentially could happen, um, but didn't very often because people were very careful and they didn't go off alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at night, that's a, diff a little bit different. At night, there's other people, um, but more than that as a risk, there's dog packs, um, especially in the rural areas. Um, the dogs, people, everyone has a dog there and it's for security and the dogs are fairly mean and they're kept on chains during the day but as soon as it gets dark they're all let loose oh. so they want they just um they wander the villages and go house to house and nose around and um everyone usually has a little fenced yard so they don't come right up to the houses but outside of that fence you're you're run the chance of running into one of these dog packs running yeah. around yeah well that's kind of spooky it is i got chased up a tree <laughs> once it was <laughs> <laughs> I had to yell for the owner of the dog to come call him off before I could come down. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so you were uh, you went prepared for the climate, though. Uh, um, I was to a degree. I'm from Hawaii. Um, oh, all right. So you're not so prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to be cold, yeah. but I didn't know what cold really meant. Yeah. Um, and in Albania, there is no central heating or a reliable electricity or um, you know heated houses yeah. really um, what they use for cooking in Albania is wood usually in the rural areas the urban and rural areas are very different so I'm really speaking for the rural areas mm -hmm. but they have wood stoves um, and in the summer those stoves are out on the front porches of the house and they cook outside right. because it's very hot in the summer in the winter they move in move the stove inside usually into sort of a parlor area um, more the communal room of the house, mm -hmm. and the stove is runs 24 hours in that room. So there's one he heated room in the house. And that's not where you sleep. That wasn't where I slept. <laughs> <laughs> um, I lived, um, again, with a host family, and it was myself um, and a couple that were about 10 years older than me, and, and then the husband's parents. Okay. So, so sort of, and, and the grandparents slept in with the heated stove. And we'd all sit there until it was time to go to bed, and then we'd run <laughs> and get under as many blankets as we could. Did Peace Corps, uh, now they give you an uh, adjustment allowance when you first move into country, you know, to buy things like blankets and stuff like that. So in uh, Albania, was it in an inflated uh, allowance so that you could buy extra blankets? In Albania, they gave us a different allowance whether you were living in an urban or a rural area yeah. because we were with the host families. And it was assumed that, and we were paying the host families for room and board. Um, so they fed us, they housed us. Um, did they provide your bedding and stuff then? Yes. Oh, they did? Yeah, they did. Okay, so you didn't have to buy cookings or you know utensils or any of that kind of no. stuff where you were at? No, I was totally eating with the family. I mean, that was, if I ate out of the family, that was on my own budget right. um, because Peace Corps was paying them a monthly stipend to house and feed me. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if I could have done that uh, <laughs> you know, because uh, you know, the, the, the allowance if you live frugally, you can save a little bit of money, you know, for you know the yeah. vacations and stuff like that. But if you were living on a smaller well, allowance, well, we had no, but we had enough allowance. We didn't get the moving in allowance, but we had the same monthly. Mm -hmm. um, I think it went up a little bit for the urban areas, so um, we had the same monthly stipend, and okay. it was, I mean, it was with, with me where I lived. There was really not much to buy, so it, it's it lasted. So you talked about uh, you know eating with the host family. Uh, so you're eating Albanian food. 
What does that mean? <laughs> um, well, at first it was um, interesting and it's sometimes for me shocking um, because I'm vegetarian, for one thing. And their guests, um, meat is scarce. Um, they don't eat it every day, but they would like to. It's, it's a, it's, um, if they can afford to, they would like to eat it every day. And guests there are served sheep's head. And it's a steamed or boiled sheep's head whole. And the guest needs to be the first person to dig into this delicacy. And I don't eat meat. And so the first time um, I sat down, um, I had a couple of host families, actually. And so the first ham family served this the first night that I was there when I spoke very little Albanian. I was just learning. Um, and I couldn't bring myself to do it much as I tried. I couldn't eat it. Um, and it took a lot of convincing of them. Like, no, I'm not trying to be rude because it's considered rude if you don't eat what right. they're offering you. Um, so it was really challenging. Yeah. And to really also convince them that, no, it's not that I don't like your meat. I don't, like, I don't eat meat. Um, because at first they were like, well, what's wrong with our meat? Well, nothing's wrong with your meat. Um, I just don't, I don't eat meat. So it got to be where they accepted that, um, but it took, it took a couple of, I mean, probably the look on my face when the head was plopped down in front of me was, <laughs> was, it was enough to make them think about a little bit. <laughs> so uh, if they didn't eat meat on a regular basis, uh, it would, probably wasn't a bad place for you to be as a, veg a vegetarian. Then. It's a wonderful place to be as a vegetarian if you can convince people that you really are yeah. and you're not, you know, you're, you're not afraid of their meat or it's, it's nothing against them. Because in Albania, in the most remote area, they'll have um, what they call meat with garnishings. Mm -hmm. um, and you get the garnishings without the meat and you get a great, really fresh salad. Greek salad, like with um, usually goat cheese, tomato, cucumber, and onion, wow. um, and French fries and fried potatoes, which is the side of most of their dishes. Did the diet change a lot from summer to winter? Yes. Uh, because of the uh, access to vegetables and gardening? It did. Um, they ate a lot of the same things, but they pickled them for winter. So we ate a lot of pickled tomatoes and pickled peppers and pickled eggplants and pickled, um, just pickled foods. Okay. And um, they preserve fruit as well. Um, they have a lot of plums and grapes and apples. Um, apples are winter fruit, so those usually keep through the winter. Usually apples are the, f the fresher thing that you get in the winter. Yeah. Um, everything else, they'll, um, the houses there are built flat usually. They're flat roofed. So in the summer, you'll see fruit just lying all across the whole roof because they dry the fruit. So you'll see, you'll see plums and grapes, probably a little bit less so. Lots of plums. Um, drying out in the summer. D don't they get very much snow? Don't they get a lot of snow in the winter, don't they? It depends on where in the country you are. Okay. Along the coast, not at all. And um, where you were at with the flat roofs? Lot, quite a bit, yeah. Well, that's unusual because, you know, yeah. high-pitched roofs are a lot For made the snow, so the snow yeah. can run off so it doesn't, uh, you know, get yeah. too heavy. We were moderate. Like, we would get we would get a bit of snow, but it wouldn't last as long as um, the Albanian Alps, which are further north in the country than where I was. I was sort of in the middle of the yeah. country in the east, but in the middle um, from north to south. Mm -hmm. In the far north of the country, it's much colder and the houses are built differently there. All right. So in your area, they didn't get up their shovels or anything like that and shovel off the no. roofs when it got too deep? No. Okay. On very extreme winters, yes, but no, not so much. So was it, uh, did it freeze in your bedroom at night? I mean, if you left the glass water out, did it? Uh I would have to break ice to open my curtain on my little window. I'd have to crack <laughs> the ice off of it to open it. <laughs> Just the condensation inside of the room would freeze and there would be you know, maybe half an inch of ice yeah. freezing the curtain to the window. I never lived like that, you know, outside the country, but I did in, in the United yeah. States, uh, you know, because I had friends that lived out in the country uh, in Michigan on farms and stuff. And it, they had a, a oil stove, but it was in one room. And the, where we slept yeah. was upstairs and, uh, you know, he had water that, and it was frozen the it next morning when we got up. I think the hardest part of winter there for me mm -hmm. was um, bathing and, and going to the bathroom mm -hmm. because it's just so cold and there's no heated room. And so we do heat, you know, we would haul buckets of water up to the house and heat them and get a little bit of a bucket bath. Yeah. Um, but it was just so cold. Um, that it was just as fast as possible, 10 seconds, <laughs> if possible. Um, and then we had going, everyone has, they don't have indoor plumbing there because there's no running water in most of the areas, um, at least outside of the cities. 
Um, and so they have outhouses that are also not warmed and are often very drafty. Um, so that also is really cold. Um, yeah. um, Albania has gone through some changes in the last 10 or 15 years. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, Albania um, was a communist country for about 50 years with one of the strongest um, regimes in the world um, and most isolated. So um, in 1991, um, in 1989, the dictator passed away, and his successor in 1991 called for a vote for the people to decide what kind of government they wanted. So in 1991, they voted in democracy. Um, around that time, unfortunately, there was a lot of um, destruction of infrastructure, of factories, um, of businesses, of government, um, of the actual buildings. There was a lot of looting and just destroying the property. Um, which still now um, is very hard for Albania because they used to produce everything they needed and had even a bit of excess and mm -hmm. now um, they're having to import most things other than um, probably the fruits and vegetables and, and animals that they raise there. Were you in the first group to go into Albania? I was in the fifth group. Fifth group? Yeah. And then uh, uh, you actually evac yeah. after one year because of uh, uh, instability within the country? Yeah, they, there was instability in the country. Um, there had been some pyramid schemes that were started um, by, there were, there were a number of different ones and people, there, there were you know, 200, 300 percent returns in a month on these um, investments. So people were selling their houses and their cows and everything. And in 1997, they collapsed. Actually, in the end of 96, they mm -hmm. collapsed. Um, and this resulted in the, um, the people took, um, held the government responsible for a lot of that, for allowing it to happen um, and allowing those, the pyramid schemes to, raise, to rise to the level that they did. Um, so people started um, looting the military arms stores, um, started in little pockets in the south and, and then little pockets in the north. Um, and then in the spring of 97, the whole country, um, there were, um, I think it's estimated to about a million and a half automatic weapons just wandering around the country. Um, every, everyone had one. And people were not necessarily, certain things were targeted, yeah. um, government buildings, um, but in general people were just shooting them up in the air. Okay. But it was just constant machine gun fire. Has it stabilized since then? It has, very much. And is Peace Corps back in country? Peace Corps will be going back, I think, this summer. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they'll be going into, do you think they're going into the same type of programs? Uh, um, I'm not sure. Now you were in agriculture and I forestry? I was in agroforestry. They agroforestry. started with Albania um, with each, um, English teachers. Um, and then the second program to start there was business and NGO development. Mm -hmm. um, and then agroforestry was the, was the last group to get started there. We were the second group of agroforesters that were there in 97. I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you speak some Albanian for us? <laughs> Sure. Even a greeting. I just, I've never heard it. Mirmanjis um, is good morning. Okay. People don't really say hi or hello. They greet you good morning, Mirmanjis, or Mirzita is good day. And Mimbrama is good evening. Okay. What is it similar to in uh, uh, structure, language structure? It's really unique. Um, it ties back to the Illyrian language, which is one of the original languages. Um, it's an Indo European language, but it's very unique. Yeah. Um, it has a lot of words borrowed from, um, from Greek and Turkish, um, but the actual language structure is its own. Okay, because culture of Al Albania is pretty ancient, going back into, you were t uh, talking about Roman ruins and stuff. And yeah, the, the Illyrian culture is very ancient, um, and then it was under Turkish rule for about 500 years um, that went up until early, this, uh, early in the last century. Mm -hmm. Um, and during that time, most of the population was um, converted to Muslim. So 70% mm -hmm. of Albanians are Muslim mm -hmm. in Albania. That varies in Albanian populations outside of the country, I think. Mm -hmm. but, um, okay. So they're very, very strong Turkish influence in their culture and, and their language, um, words at least. Yeah. Um, I noticed you brought some uh, warm clothing to uh, <laughs> in form of mittens <laughs> to show us. Uh, are these... Uh, uh, local uh, woven in Albania? Yeah, Albanians um, lead very much, or traditionally um, lead a very subsistence 
existence there where they grow a lot of their own food and, and vegetables and, and raise the animals that they eat. Mm -hmm. um, and this also provides them with winter clothing. These socks were made by my host grandmother. Um, she was an amazing knitter um, and she would, she spun the wool um, and then dyed it with plants that were on our little homestead in our village. So this is dyed, um, I don't know how well you can see the colors, but this is the natural sheep's wool color. Okay. And then there's walnut. Um, this is used with the shawl of the walnut. And then this is quince, um, which is a very strange fruit that they use there to, um, to make jam. I had never seen it before. It looks sort of like an apple, but it's very hard and yellow and very bitter if you take a bite out of it. Um, but they cook it up a lot of sugar and make jam. And, is and the red is from uh, berries or something? Then? The red, no, the red is an imported oh, acrylic um, dyed yarn. Okay. Um, but they make a lot of their own clothes. You'll see women wearing fully knitted skirts and, and tops um, and outfits. Mostly in wool? Mostly um, in wool. It's changing. You'll see a lot more um, imported just acrylic yarn now. Okay. And, and it's, you can note the difference because of the bright colors. When they buy the yarn, you'll see lime green and orange and <laughs> full outfits of, of really bright colors. Yep. So uh, is this pair also made by your grandmother? This pair I made because in the winter there, you there's not to much to do <laughs> because it's too cold, especially working um, in agriculture like I was. Um, the winter the ground freezes and you can't, other than networking and trying to set up what you're going to do in the spring, there's not a lot you can do. Okay. So and uh, you must have spun this wool too then. This wool I did not. <laughs> right. This was my first big knitting project and I was knitting the wool um, to make a sweater. Mm -hmm. I mean I was spinning the wool to make a sweater when we were evacuated out. So that my next project was going to be one that I spun from, from the start. Okay. So you, uh, you had a, what do you call it? What do you call it? A machine that spins wool? They don't use a machine. Um, yeah. What they do is they have, um, the villages are set up in what used to be communes, where each village has what it needs to, um, to grind the corn into cornmeal, um, the wheat into flour, the wool to card and clean the wool. Um, so basically, you, you get the wool fresh off the sheep with, you know, with things stuck in it and, and needs, needs cleaning and needs um, carding, mm -hmm. needs um, brushing out. So you take it down, there's a machine that does all of that. And then you get back a big burlap sack of just the wool, just fuzzy wool. And then out of that, you spin it by hand. You have a long stick in one hand, and then you're doing it in your hand the other. So you'll see the women who are herding their animals. The animals there are kept um, very close to home. They're not, her they're not out to pasture like we see here. Um, so someone has to watch the cow all day. So someone's job is to watch the livestock and be with them all day to make sure they don't eat someone's corn or go where they're not supposed to go. So you'll see the women, um, they'll wear aprons with pockets and they'll have the yarn and, or the wool or the yarn depending on if they're knitting or spinning in their pockets. And as they talk and herd the animals, their hands are constantly moving and spinning or knitting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you say a stick, uh, the stick is just uh, like you have a ball of wool on there and they're they're pulling well you have the wool you just have the wool in a pile yeah um, what does the stick do you spin you you spin the stick so in your hand in 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 your i'm right-handed yeah. so in my right hand and i would hold the stick yeah. my left hand i would um be be twisting the wool into the appropriate size strand and then this you're spinning it so it's sort of like um when you make a tea leaf lay here you twist it and twist it and twist it so you're twisting it real fine, and then with the motion of twisting the stick, you're, you're um, twirling it more to make like a rope. Okay. Are you also winding in the, the spun wool up on the stick? Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right. I, I kind of get a better picture now. Yeah. Maybe I'll try and find a picture on it. You know, <laughs> so lay it in the program there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you had some other pictures. Uh, did, uh, were there some, some here that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, I just wanted to share. Um, when the terrain of Albania, mm -hmm. um, as it's, it's very different than here, it tends to be very dry mm -hmm. um, and there's been a lot of deforestation there, so it's very barren. Um, they use wood for heating, so um, they've cut down a lot of the trees. Yeah. Um, so I have a picture here just of a hillside um, and a farmer herding his goats to the hillside and you can see how small all of the shrubs are. Um, and then... I just wanted to show a picture 
of, this was my host grandfather harvesting grapes. He's standing on the roof. Okay. So this is where you would see all of the fruit laid out to dry. Um, and he's harvesting grapes because they make their own um, wine and raki, which is a distilled liquor, <laughs> usually from plums and grapes. Mm -hmm. um, and every family makes their own in the winter. When after the fruit's all harvested, they ferment it and it ferments. And then right around New Year's, everything's mm -hmm. ready to go. Um, then your, the wine is ready and the raki is ready and everyone celebrates. New Year's is very big there. Yeah. Um, one other quick thing about Albania. Albania, every house in Albania has electricity, um, which I was very surprised to see. Um, it's not on all the time. Some people may have it for an hour a day, but every, even the mo most remote village has a power line yeah. going to it. Uh, Zavi, I, I, we're coming to the close of our program. Um, I'm sure you know it would be really great to see more of your pictures and hear more about Albania, but uh, that's all we can do for today. Okay. Thanks a lot for coming. I really enjoyed it. And thank you. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us uh, with today's program, and uh, please join us again next time when we visit with another uh, Peace Corps volunteer and bring the world home. Aloha. Yeah.